Hello, everybody. My name is Martin Lovers. I'm the Chief Trend Watcher of Supply Chain Media. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We are live, and in the next hour, we talk about uh, resilience in supply chain risk management. And we have two, two uh, great experts uh, joining me. So let me uh, start and introduce the two people you all see uh, on camera. So first, uh, Iris, welcome. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for having me uh, in this webinar. My name is Iris Ekman. I'm a principal consultant uh, at Camelot and responsible for the topic of uh, supply chain risk and resilience management. I'm uh, having a quite quantitative background, applying quantitative methods from operations research and discrete event simulation in order to identify supply chain risk and then also bring mitigation options into the play. Um, yeah, my, my journey towards supply chain risk actually started in 2008. Yeah, so it's a long way um, I could gain experience uh, in the topic of supply chain risk and resilience uh, at customer sites. And um, yeah, very happy to, to present here some key insights from our approach. Uh, hi, Thomas. Could you introduce yourself briefly? Yeah, sure. Good to meet you all. Uh, I'm Thomas Abel. I'm a partner from uh, Camelot Management Consultants. So I've basically been working the last 25 years in supply chain management, both in industry as well as in consulting. And at Camelot, I help clients to, to optimize their supply chains, also better serve and enable the business. And definitely, especially in the last years, making supply chains more resilient has been a key part of that. So looking forward to the discussion. All right. Um... A few things, uh, how it holds rules. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and the PDF will be made uh, available afterwards within uh, 48 hours. And also the recording will be uh, made available on YouTube. Um, Everybody is on mute, so did the audience, but uh, you know, I will encourage you to ask questions. So uh, please ask questions along the way. So you have your Q&A uh, functionality on the right hand side. You see the question bubble text bubble on the right hand side so you can have a chat but also have a question so I will track down. If these questions are in line of the conversation I will be having with uh, Iris and Thomas, you know, I will ask these questions immediately. There will also will be uh, a Q&A at the end. And uh, if, there is no, if there are more questions or, you know, we run out of time, there's also a 30 minutes afterwards so we can um, have a further discussion in the lounge afterwards um, uh, and then we, we will be joining you at table one. So you have a conversation uh, uh, with uh, Iris, Thomas, and myself. So I will uh, put off the cameras right now, and then we will move over to the slide deck so you can enlarge your screen. You see the small four arrows in the upper right corner, so you can enlarge your screen so we'll have a better view on the, on the presentation. All right, so getting uh, along um, in the presentation. So. Supply Chain Media has created an overview called the SCM Consulting Subway Map. So there are a lot of supply chain consultants in Europe, uh, and I don't, don't cr uh, go through all of them. But basically, we see Camelot uh, in the upper side. So they are um, a large supply chain uh, consulting boutique, I would say. So you have the big four and strategy consultant, but Camelot is a, a real supply chain consulting firm um, and also across Europe. So that's ba basically what, what this, uh, this framework is saying. You can download this, uh, this whole slide. There's more about supply chain consulting, who's doing what in Europe. But uh, now we are focusing on, on Camelot and especially on uh, supply chain risk management. All right, first um, we talk about, uh, so this is the agenda. And first we talk we, we, the overall uh, view and then we zoom in later on to a business case and, uh, and then uh, Iris will uh, uh, you know, zoom in on the topic. But first, uh, Thomas, can you explain why are we talking about uh, risk management at this moment? Yeah, so I think probably you all sense it uh, in the news. We have something like the perfect storm here, right? So we have supply chains which have been stretched over the last decades, basically over the globe. They've been optimized for cost. Buffers have been taken out, right? And this is now hitting an environment where turbulence is increasing on all fronts. Yeah, just take the way how we went from Corona to labor shortages, to material shortages, to now a war in Europe and an energy crisis. So it shows an extreme level of turbulence. And I think the question is, so how is supply chain man risk management keeping up with that? Yeah, and we think the traditional risk management is still too locally focused. It still looks too much at single equipment, single plants, and it should be much more network focused. And most importantly, 
it's much too slow and static for the current turbulent situation. So you can't manage this type of a situation with annual risk assessments. You need a different, more, much more data-driven approach here, I would say. All right. Uh, and, you know, if you look at uh, from a, a larger perspective, you know, we have a, maybe you have a lot of experience and expertise uh, in supply chain and risk management, but how does it all count, this kind of expertise and, uh, and experience? Yeah, I think that would be the first, I always would say, well, let's get the most experienced people here, right? Who've seen a lot in the world, who have gray hair, ideally, right? And they wouldn't they be good to predict the next risk event? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, Martin, whether you know who that who that quote is from. I don't know, perhaps you can get a sense. Uh, no, but I'm, I'm a prejudiced. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, it's it's from a, actually from the captain of the Titanic, yeah. And uh, I mean, this guy he had 40 years of experience in uh, in shipping, right? Was the best captain of the world, and then the iceberg struck. So it's also about us thinking a bit. Perhaps we need to accept that we're just not very good at predicting events because so many things can happen. We don't know where they will happen and how they will happen and especially the frequency, they will likely be too infrequent for us to remember. And that is just human nature, right? So I think relying on experience is a bit shaky, I would say, in this type of environment. And if you look at the Titanic, you know, uh, there was a build, it was a brand new ship and it was very robust and, uh, you know, very innovative. But still, it, it, it didn't work, you know, and, uh, you know, it, 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 all things failed in the Titanic. So... Uh unexpected things but on the other hand it you know iceberg wasn't that like a black swan for the titanic exactly so not even a big uh, black swan and i think so many things could have happened right yeah and it's it's just hard to predict them yeah and uh perhaps we need some different approaches right perhaps we need something much more innovative and uh much more data driven yeah, and get kind of the best scientists together yeah to 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 predict risks i mean that could be another approach yeah yes so let, let, let's look back a, a bit, uh, a few years, uh, 10 to 15 years backwards, and let's uh, look at uh, what happened in the world and what is the traditional approach and how we should uh, well tackle the, the, the new turbulent uh, environment. Yeah, so we, we always like to give that example here of the World Economic Forum because you, you would say the World Economic Forum, aren't they putting together the most powerful companies on earth, the most powerful institutions which have endless data to predict what's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. And they have this interesting risk report. You see the top, top five risks. So let's see how good are they actually at predicting risks, right? So if you, if you see, for example, 2008, right, to roughly 2000, uh, 12 here on that on that on that list right of the top risks oh, we had fiscal crisis and financial failure here at the top risk yeah for the economy and for companies and where why was that right that was basically a reaction to what happened and many of us would still remember it in 2008 and 2009 with the financial crisis right with people carrying uh, carton boxes out of the lehman brothers buildings right yeah. and then suddenly you have other events right suddenly Climate change is popping up, yeah, 2011. And why was that? Okay, perhaps there the year before, we had a big heat wave in Europe that sent a lot of reminder to people that global warming is still a fact, yeah? Yeah. And I think we could go on like that to, to see that uh, there are so many things which could happen like then in 2014, suddenly infectious diseases coming out of nowhere and of course, what happened the year before, it was the Ebola crisis yeah, with yeah. very bad, yeah, very bad implications in Africa. Um, and then 2017 onwards, suddenly weapons of mass destruction, making it really to the top of the risk list, right, which was, of course, very much related to the political developments we had in Iran and in North Korea, which were already happening and starting the years before. Yeah. yeah. And now you guess, right? I mean, what was the top risk in 2021 last year? Um, and I think uh, after the fact, you will all say it's infectious diseases and you're right, right? Yeah. And uh, so due to that, I would say, well, compliment to the World Economic Forum, they're really very strong at identifying risk, but after they happen, right? And that is also yeah. something we think we really need to acknowledge. We are awful at predicting risk events before they happen, especially the infrequent ones and the severe ones. Yeah, so let's be realistic about what we can do and challenge 
how we deal with this traditional approach of managing risks. Yeah, it's interesting to see, you know, what the heat wave of uh, 2010, you know, now we are in 2022 and we have another terrible heat wave all around the world, uh, yeah. the worst in uh, 500 years. So uh, it's even, you know, getting to the extreme, although we have seen it looking backward, you know, uh, we, we could have seen it. But then again, last year, we had a lot of flooding in, in China and now we have a, a, a huge global heat wave. Yeah, and I think you can see how in the last years, the whole topic of climate change, right, has climbed up the ladder with people like, I think we had the hottest five summers, right, in the last seven years or so, right, and we have a lot of flooding, as you say, so and that people are focused on that again, but will that be the next big ev event which is striking, frankly, we don't know and we cannot know. And, you know, looking at this graph, you know, there are only um, uh, five boxes for each year. But if you have to uh, tick in the box for this year, I think, you know, we could tick all these uh, boxes. Yeah, you, you, you could tick them all. You're right, right? You could uh, uh, warfare, yeah, uh, yeah, climate change, yeah, scarce and, resources. So they're all there, right? And, and, and they are more and more interdependent than before, I would say. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. And that's why so, we would say yeah. like very an approach which puts a strong focus on understanding the full network, right? And the interconnectivity is becomes more and more important. So if, if you get to drill down to the supply chain environment, so how do you uh, relate to this? And how do you uh, get to a more modern supply chain decision making? Yeah, so we would say, and that's also why the title of the of the seminar, right? Where you said, let's let's get rid of the illusions that we can manage risks. Let's move to what we call risk-aware decision-making, which is a much more modern approach. Yeah. And it needs basically three new capabilities. And one of them here we, we can see here is we need to rethink how we measure supply chain success. I think we all know kind of the world of service cost and capital. We've tracked that up and down on different levels. So we're experts in that, right? But we need to start actually measuring and quantifying risk and that is and actually embedding that in decision making processes you know, how to do that yeah, yeah. Let, let, let's let's see in the course of the presentation yeah yeah but i was wondering you know when i look at the, to the left hand side uh, surface cost and capital you know uh, 10 years ago david Levy tried to uh, take a, a cost number to risk and uh, you know to 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 try to squeeze uh, uh, risk management into the, the triangle on the right and on the left hand side, but now mm -hmm. it's quite mm -hmm. hard to put a label on sustainability and risk, I would say, and that's the reason why you added these two arrows next to uh, cost service and uh, capital. Yeah, but our, our approach is very much we just need to start measuring these two success criteria as independent performance criteria. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, they have an impact in the end on, on the cost, on the service, but uh, I think there's a broader way of expressing risk, for example, as an estimated or projected lost profit, right? Yeah. And uh, sustainability, I don't get into that. That's a whole new discussion, which also like we're very much standing at the beginning. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, based on what you said, I think also, yeah, multi-objective decision-making is becoming more and more important, right? Yeah. So and it's not only service and cost, it's also many other factors which need to be taken into account. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, and it, it would be too, too simplified if you would uh, keep on using uh, the, the, well, the, the triangle on the left. So that is probably uh, your message here. Absolutely, yeah. So, so how do we get to a, a sense of risk awareness uh, decision making? Yeah, I think once we've cracked the nut, so to say, how to quantify risk and yeah. risk impact, I think it's, of course, not all about quantification and measurement, right? From our, my experience, the most important change is people and processes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would say companies should focus on five key processes in their supply chains and how to better reflect risk in these processes in a very targeted yeah, and prominent way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just take one example yeah? so on the very left. So it's the network network design. So running supply network uh, optimization, for example. So for example, asking yourself, do I stay with fast sourcing or more near sourcing? 
And the way how these decisions have been made over the last decades has very much always been driven by unit cost, by CAPEX, by savings, by NPV. Mm -hmm. And there were, then there was also risk as an additional qualitative assessment. And we think that's not good enough anymore in our environment. We need to really introduce risk prominently into the equation of decisions in a very quantitative way. Yeah. And yeah, similar, we see a very important topic, yeah, uh, supply chain parameterization, the second from the right. Yeah. How do you define your buffers, be it yeah. stocks or lead times? We see this is still too often still... Yeah, rough judgment, rule of thumb. I think the current environment does not forgive that. We need to use the maximum of data we have available to define the optimum both location of risk stocks as well as level of risk stocks. And especially on that part, you know, I see a lot of companies that they still have fixed lead times within their ERP system. So because maybe they have been set during the implementation, but times has changed. But now, you know, you see uh, the lead times are, uh, are changing and maybe yeah. you have to uh, address it uh, in a different way or a different shaded way that you have lead time for different kind of types of customers. For your A customer, you have a different yes. kind of lead yes. time than for your C customers. Exactly. Yeah. That means, means also, I mean, we need to much more rigorously yeah, track lead times, not treat them as a deterministic variable, right? Which is yeah. constant, but track their variability over time and their bias. Does it, is it longer, is it shorter? And embed that into, into a parameterization of stocks. Yeah? Yeah. And all yeah. this is possible in a rules-based way, right? Yeah. And, and now you see more uh, dependency on needed on a multi-echelon inventory management. Where do I put my inventory, at, you know, and maybe on your even on your supply uh, side have a reservation for a certain uh, inventory mm -hmm. so that's a different kind of setup i would say also on that that, that that part absolutely and i think iris will talk a lot about that because in the end when it comes to risk mitigation it's about where do we get the biggest bang for the buck if you want yeah. so if you have yeah. 100 millions to spend on mitigation of risks what's the maximum effect you can have and then where do you invest in dual sourcing, where do you invest in more risk stock? So this should, should not be based just on a rough judgment-based decision. Okay, we, we'll get it, uh, to that point later. But maybe you know, uh, you can give an overview of what you consider are the different levels of supply chain risk management. Yeah, so we think uh, in addition, yeah, companies need to upgrade, let's say the, the methodology here. Right, and uh, we see here coming from the basic approaches where it's still very much focused on yeah visibility, yeah where do I have how much stock, how much orders, how much demand, capacity, etc. And now we would say many companies have moved to a more advanced stage, right, yeah. where uh, they use uh, what if analysis, they use scenarios, but still it's not dynamic enough, yeah. So still, if you have this advanced risk management, you're still very much focused on a single point view. Yeah, you use discrete events. So you have kind of the, the, the assumption you can model the world with three scenarios. And yeah. that's not correct based on what we discussed before. Yeah. yeah. So that's why we, we would say you, we need to move to this expert level, yeah, which we see on the right-hand side. Yeah. So and how do you describe this as expert level? So what are the, the, you know, how do you recognize it if you get there? Yeah, so basically, in our view, we need this method which really mirrors the uncertainty we have. I would say the traditional scenario-based modeling does not mirror the real turbulence and uncertainty of the environment. Mm -hmm. So that's why we need something we call dynamic risk management. Yeah, so it's definitely multi-point. It looks at the full network. It looks at all the interdependencies. So what happens in Europe if you have a supply problem in LATAM where you may have a major supplier or only a C-part supplier? Right? Mm -hmm. You have all these ripple effects in the network, which you need to model. And then we use stochastic programming. So that reflects many different outcomes. And we not only use a few risk scenarios, but we basically use like thousands of different profiles. Because as we remember from the beginning, we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, interesting stuff. And uh, I did a, a small poll in the last two weeks and I did it on LinkedIn. So basically on the left-hand side, you see the result of the poll 
in our group called Supply Chain Movement. And on the right hand side, you see the same uh, poll I did on my personal profile. So I have a lot of uh, connections uh, in supply chain. And you'll see, you know, uh, on the left uh, is 23 votes, and the right hand side, uh, 20 votes to this poll. Um, maybe you can comment on this uh, uh, result, uh, uh, Thomas. What do you think of these results of this uh, small poll? Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of mirrors the four levels, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, it would basically show, and I would kind of agree with that, that most companies are more in the basic intermediate stage. So they're more focused on the visibility. Yeah. So where are, where do they, where are they covered against uh, uncertainty and the supply chain network design? Mm -hmm. And when it comes really to the stochastic modeling or programming, which I described, and really using scenarios effectively. Right, there's still a lot of room for improvement. Yeah. yeah. So I think many people are talking about scenarios, but how to actually use them, yeah, effectively, yeah, right. That's still such some gaps here. And interesting that we don't really see so much of a difference, right, between left and uh, no. right hand side. No. So yeah. Um, you know, um, and maybe we should uh, have a larger uh, uh, survey to, to cover all this. But uh, you know, when we look to the world right now, and it's now very much dominant, especially in Europe, about the gas price and the coming winter. So um, how do you, how do you, um, you know, um, take into the account this kind of uh, development in the gas prices and, and, and as such? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, and I'm, I'm from Germany, uh, right? And you can imagine this is a huge topic at the moment, but not yep. only in Germany, also in other yep. European countries, right? And um, in terms of the requirement and the role the supply chain can play here this is actually yeah a big opportunity as well so what happened to us at a, at a client where we implemented that new risk aware decision making approach we got a request basically from the board where the question was so how does a three uh, three months gas shortage yeah, impact us and concretely how does it impact the sales and the profit and if you have this type of a new approach implemented it becomes more of a topic of press of a button well plus some validation of course you can give an answer very quickly and what we see here that basically we could exactly say when does a reduction in in gas supply impact our in terms of lost sales yeah we saw here that was very quickly already beyond 10 percent we had a first lost sales impact we yeah. could also say what's the total impact in millions of euros i can't release that figure here of no, course no, right no. and uh, but also when do I get below a certain critical service level threshold, which yeah. my customers would expect? That's also important to know. How much can I buffer? And then most importantly, at the bottom right, which nodes in the supply chain are most impacted? So here we yeah. saw our DC1, then DC2. DC3 can more buffer it if it is yeah. a three three months shortage. So and understanding this dynamics and connected in, in, in the network really enabled us to yeah, define very tailored and effective response. Yeah. I can also imagine now you have some graphs, but also I can imagine that you also have maps showing uh, the coverage of uh, marketing service and uh, how to, to, to expect and, uh, that it will impact certain geographies, uh, maybe uh, yes. Scandinavia or Iberia or whatever. Absolutely. I think EOS will show a lot of that because there's, there's a solution and a, a tool behind. Yeah. Um, but I always think it more from the, from the, from the people, from the process. And I think for supply chain, yeah, and supply chain leaders, this is an important opportunity to create value for the business, right? Quickly understand how does this turbulent environment impact the network? And what does this mean? Not in abstract service level percentages, but in lost sales in lost profit, right? And then identifying, so where are the critical spots here? Yeah, which DC, which plant, which product, which supplier? Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's, I think, a whole new dimension of value also supply chain leaders can, can create. Yeah? yeah, it's a great new value, I would say, you know, but all right. Um, so let's move over to Iris. You know, uh, Iris, you know, you, you have a deep dive on how to, uh, to approach all this and some examples. So maybe you, uh, Tell us how to start this whole journey to get to the, the, the more mature level of uh, supply chain risk management. Yes, of course. So um, or what we have seen somehow motivates that we need to have a different perspective on the topic of supply chain risk. And Thomas introduced that new perspective. Before we actually start, we also, 
basically that's starting, yeah, changing the perspective. And we propose to have different paradigms in mind when thinking of supply chain risk management. And I'd like to, to show you three different paradigms that we are using in order to define and develop our solutions for the customer. So here, basically, you can see one of the first paradigms. Mm, there are several concepts that need to be considered in order to de identify the level of risk. Mm -hmm. Currently, the majority of people focus very much on what you can see on the left-hand side of the slide, the so-called disruptive triggers. Yeah? So identifying what could happen, where in the world, what might be the impact. But we proclaim that it is necessary to also have a view on the vulnerability of the supply chain. Of course, that's also a new wording coming up, yeah, vulnerability and resilience. What is the level of resilience? But also important is the right-hand side that you can see here on the slide. Because if a disruptive trigger is in place and we know the level of vulnerability or resilience, still the objective could be different and therefore also the level of risk. We need to consider the objectives of the decision makers. How is a supply chain being evaluated? What is the key performance indicator that indicates the performance level of the supply chain? And that mm -hmm. might differ from, from company to company, from decision maker to decision maker. We also claim that it's necessary to not consider, uh, that's basically done today, and it's also an approach towards um, building up a um, a resilient supply chain. But once we need to come from so-called risk indices towards what is the exact loss in terms of objective once something happens. Yeah. So a risk index of eight out of 10, what does it mean? Is It, it, it seems to be very bad, but yeah. how bad in terms of my, my overall sales or margin? And second, what can I do against it? Yeah. So immediately I would like to, to mitigate that kind of risk level. And um, how can we do that? And then coming to the to the last point on the right hand side, which is the attitude of the decision maker. Again, having the same disruptive trigger, having the same vulnerability level, having the same objective, still the attitude of a decision maker might change from one company to another, from one uh, supply chain manager to the other. What is combining all those aforementioned concepts is time. Yeah, so if we consider, for instance, this uh, Icelandic Vulcan exploding in 2011, um, mm -hmm. it had a huge impact on automotive industries and automotive supply chains. But we would not care if that Vulcan had erupted during Christmas period when uh, production is down anyway. So time is a huge factor that we need to consider. And therefore, Thomas explained why we can't need to come from a static to a dynamic risk assessment. Well, and what you see on the left-hand side is every concept or the concepts related to a value chain. And the key questions we need to answer in any risk assessment is how vulnerable is my value chain in its current state in terms of goal achievement? And second, how vulnerable is my value chain under future realizations of uncertainty? Yeah, because the future might change, and we see we are currently in a process that it does change tremendously, and we are very bad at predicting. So we need to identify in which situation would our supply chain or value chain behave differently. And on the right-hand side, key questions coming from, from the decision makers are how much performance deterioration am I willing to accept? Sometimes we do not need to include some mitigation measures because simply the level of risk that we have identified is not big enough to um, yeah, argue for mitigation implementation. And second and last, how much money am I willing to invest to improve resilience? Because mitigation is not for free, it comes at a cost and it needs in the end to pay off. I, I can manage on the right hand side, especially on the attitude side that you also have differentiation with between companies of how much are you willing to delegate to lower levels to decide in your risk mitigation exactly yeah so um, um there are so many differences that need to be discussed among the different decision makers and it also depends on the view they have and the the level of responsibility they have on the supply yeah. chain yeah, yeah. You know, and so so this this uh, all complexity uh, is urging for a new kind of uh, a change in mindset, uh, I guess. Yes. 
and that's that, that's exactly the second uh, the second major paradigm that we want to propose, mm -hmm. and uh, it's kind of the heart of our overall process or, or approach. Yeah, so we propose to change the mind towards an impact driven quantification rather than an external event identification. Mm -hmm. So if we take, for example, again, the example of this uh, Icelandic Vulcano, yeah, that, that's a disruptive trigger. And that disruptive trigger had an impact on the effect on the supply chain environment via releasing that ash cloud. And then it had an impact on the supply chain itself. But it was not that kind of a diffuse impact. It was a very precise impact on a specific process, namely mm -hmm. air freight transportation. Yeah. So via this release of AshCloud, the air freight transportation in Europe was hit. And while it's very difficult to predict and to describe the impact of a volcano eruption, what we can do very good is to model the impact on a specific process. Because a process can be described like with, with capacity yeah, or with lead time or with cost. So basically, we could say that impact would be equal to a capacity of zero in between specific dates or a lead time increase close to infinity. Yeah? So we can model those kinds of uh, impact and we should focus on the impact rather than on the identification of events that might occur or not. And then we are yeah, pretty much good in knowing what our supply chain and value chain processes are looking like. And then we do not care whether that's a volcanic eruption, a hurricane or a labor strike. So that's what we proclaim, yeah, stop chasing events and focus on the identification and quantification of the interdependencies within the network. Because then we are good in quantifying criticality of resources and good in defining and quantifying what mitigation actions are needed. But I can also imagine that, you know, especially in this kind of complex time with the uh, Ukraine war and, uh, you know, a uh, drought in, in the, all over the world, that there are all kinds of ripple effects and maybe you know um different kind of you know disruption all over interdependent mm -hmm. and maybe or you have a first second and third order effects so mm -hmm. is it also you know are you still able to model all this kind of uh, ripple effects in this uh, in the dependencies i mean the ripple we have maybe to differ here between um, two levels of ripple effects. Yeah. One ripple effect would be everything that's external to our supply chain. Yeah, as you said, um, Ukraine war also um, had an impact on um, availability of suppliers close to that area. Yeah. Uh, that's something that is not directly connected within the supply chain, of course. Yeah? So it's something external to the supply chain. But then if a specific process like um, um, delivering the delivery of a specific supplier is interrupted, then of course it has directly internal ripple effects in the supply chain. Okay. And yeah. as we are describing the supply chain via digital twin, yes, of course, that's something that we can uh, model equally. Okay, we, we'll get to that later on. Yes. And you have a, a third uh, paradigm shift, uh, I reckon. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so, and the third one is that we um, propose to shift from, from reactive to more proactive assessment. So what are we doing today? Yeah? We consider transactional and master data, so information about the network and the processes via different parameters in our supply chain planning uh, solutions. What we get out of it is something that we call a tactical reference plan. Once now we have an effective future that is occurring, for instance, a port lockdown, then traditional risk management starts to identify where are my, my risk sh or my shipments at risk. Mm -hmm. What can I do against it? Well, there is nothing to do, right? Uh, it's very difficult. I, I, I could send helicopters, would look very strange uh, in front of a port and also would not work. Yep. Instead, what we propose is to use the exact same data as it's been used for supply chain planning and conduct stress testing and mitigation optimization. And as yeah, explained earlier, we now do not consider events, but rather we consider how a specific process would look like if being impacted. Yeah? So, for instance, capacity would um, decrease tremendously or demand would increase, yeah? or in the COVID situation where we also had a combined cost increase over time. And of course, we also need to consider normal operations. And that's also something that is very often forgotten in uh, risk management because we want to prepare not only for the bad situations, but also for the normal operations. Mm 
But anyway, if we consider those impacts on the processes, then what we can do is to adapt our supply chains and particularly the parameters within our supply chains um, to a new level. Yeah, Knowing if we use this capacity level, for instance, then our underlying supply chain is pretty much prepared. And then exactly that's what we can see here. Yeah, We need to re-parameterize um, our uh, capacity for instance, or our inventory or any other mitigation option. And we will talk about that later. Why does it help us? Now, if we consider tomorrow, we need to adapt the capacities. We get a new tactical reference plan that is already incorporating potential future realizations and is prepared for that. So if we encounter, uh, again, a port lockdown or a different future and even a different future, then traditional risk management would start and identify, OK, there is a limited risk compared to the situation where we have not included any mitigation option. And that's the overall goal. And we can only do that if we think from a proactive perspective rather than reactive. So, so uh, the good part of all this, you have these maps with uh, all those sh ships at risk, and now that, that's getting up. You know, uh, we have more insights uh, with uh, on maps of all this. But on the other hand, you have to also match capacity and uh, service level, and well, in the middle of the stress test to get a better view. What does it all mean? All these ships and all exactly. these uh, green and red dots. Exactly. Yeah. So that's something that we need to do prior to something happening and hitting yeah. our supply chain. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so uh, if you see all this, so we have a new approach for tomorrow, uh, you explained it. So what are the, 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 the overall guiding principles for all this? Yeah, so to sum, uh, sum it all up, yeah. So first of all, we proclaim so to stop chasing events, yeah, because you will never be complete. And as Thomas pointed out in the beginning, also not right. Yeah? Second, we say prepare or start preparing today because we never know when the next big thing happens. Who had uh, the possibility to predict something like the corona pandemic uh, or the Ukraine war? And we don't know what will happen next. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And third, structural vulnerability is the real risk. If we know about um, the interdependencies within our network, we are pretty much prepared for whatever comes up next. You know, but still, if you, I, I have a lot of conversations uh, with the uh, supply chain directors and uh, executives, uh, but still, there's a lot of firefighting right now. But so, mm -hmm. you know, supply chain decision makers have to have some more time to step back and to have an approach uh, for all this. So, you know, on one hand, they need uh, some firefighting, but on the other hand, they they need to, you know, save some time and they have some you know, uh, reserve some time to have a more strategic approach to all this. I, I fully agree. Of course, we need the reactive part of it, of uh, the reactive part of risk um, management. But currently, we are so much focusing on the risk documentation and the identification of events. I propose to just step, yeah, two step back, yeah, and thinking yeah. about what could happen in the future and how could we prepare if something happens on our processes not knowing what it might be. Yeah? We, I, I think we, we, we cannot imagine the possibilities that can hit our supply chains. But just thinking about, okay, what if this specific process uh, is being disrupted? What if this process is disruptive? What if both are being disruptive? What if the entire region is being disrupted? And what can we do against it from an end-to-end -end perspective? Yeah? As Thomas pointed out, not locally, but rather thinking in an end-to-end -end perspective in order to increase our overall, or not only increase, make our supply chain performance stable, yeah. independent of the future to come. But it's good to see that uh, the people listening in right now they're already taking a step back in this hour mm. to 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 uh, have a look yes, at all this. And, so that's, that's a good starting point. Yes. All right. So let's get to, to the third part, and then we get to examples. You know uh, what you have explained earlier. So um, maybe you can now have a, a, a better definition of what are the core major capabilities uh, to get to, to this point. Yeah. So what we would need in order to um, provide 
answers um, to the aforementioned concepts, yeah, because concepts are nice, but now we need to put it into a specific approach and the approach might also be nice, but the approach can only be as good as, as our customers are satisfied and um, yeah, happy with the results and also have implications on how to redesign their supply chains or re-parameterize their supply chains. Mm -hmm. But coming to the to the approach itself. Yeah, we propose a new data-driven approach and it consists of three major capabilities, namely network planning, supply chain stress test, and allocation and design of mitigation strategies. The first pillar, strategic network planning, focus on um, answering questions within the network. Yeah, so we have a supply chain network and normally what we need to do is to answer several questions which is uh, the same as, as um, making some decisions. Where to source, what to produce when and where, how much to store, what to ship when, how to allocate demand. So that's our normal yeah, way of planning, so to say. And we propose to have a first strategic network planning possibility, which is then optimizing the overall supply chain performance while taking those questions into account. Mm -hmm. Now, this plan provides us the possibility to compare what if something happens. And that's what we do in the supply chain stress testing. Because in the supply chain stress testing, we need to consider uncertainty. Uncertainty to supply, yeah? suppliers being disrupted, infrastructure not available, whatever you can think of, and to uncertain costs. As we currently are encountering, material costs have increased tremendously. What is with uncertain prices, development in the future? And also, of course, uncertain demands. How do our customers behave towards those supply chain, um, to, to, to the environment in general, and what is the implication of our supply chain? Maybe, maybe uh, to get there, you know, David Sensulevi, a professor of MIT, mm -hmm. uh, has written an important article, I think, 10 years ago, uh, Time to Recover and that kind of sense. And that basically, that's, that's also a part of a stress test. You know, uh, how much time can I survive when some points in the network are down? Exactly. And that's um, an approach that provides the basis for, for the approach that you currently see in the supply chain stress testing. Okay. And we developed that approach a little bit further, yeah, in incorporating also time aspect, being time dependent, yep. and develop that further yeah, to, to, ex to exactly answer the questions that you have just mentioned. Okay. How long can our network uh, sustain a disruption within the supply chain? And okay. during the stress testing, we do that. We let each and every resource within the entire network being disrupted and calculate how long can the remaining network compensate that disruption and yep. remain uh, performance stable, so to say. Yeah. So therefore, we, we calculate time to sustain and we also need to calculate uh, it not only in the risk index, but also then on the performance perspective. Yep. And then third, yeah, once we know how critical everything is, Yep. Directly, we want to know what can we do against it. And that's part of the mitigation optimization. And here we foresee like uh, different categories of mitigation, like an additional network link in the network or an additional um, uh, possibility of purchasing. Yeah, We always think about, should I dual source here that product or is it single source better? Yeah, What is the cost benefit um, in between? And there are so many materials, so difficult to answer. And then in the middle, of course, balancing capacity and inventory. So it's not only about increasing inventory, it's about balancing the possibility of increasing and improving capacity or foresee additional inventory over the end-to-end -end network in order to compensate a disruption. Well, so that are the three, mm, sorry. Yeah, no, no, uh, you know, talking about inventory, we see a lot of companies have bought huge inventories uh you know to buffer and to be you know yeah. be on the safe side also in the us you see all the warehouses all the dcs are stuck with all kind of inventory and sometimes not the right inventory by the way so uh, but that, that's exactly. not always that's the easy way out i would say you know you can also reserve capacity and you know to have strategic conversations with your suppliers to mm -hmm. do uh, reservations for capacity so reserve capacity capacity and not by uh, most of the inventory just just in case exactly exactly yeah and as you as we all know supply chains are very complex if we screw a little bit on the, on the one side of the supply chain it might have a huge impact on the other side and maybe a capacity increase of only five or ten percent which could also be made available through improvement of efficiency yeah so i'm just thinking mm -hmm. out loud but th that's actually the case we can compensate for 
having built up so much additional inventory. Maybe that is not necessary. Maybe just changing a little bit the network in terms of capacity or in terms of additional transportation links or network links or purchasing possibility might change our overall um, supply chain setup. You know, what I see right now in the U.S. and also a bit in Europe, the warehouses are so stuck with inventory, with raw materials and end products, that there is hardly any flow possible. Because, you know, they, they cannot produce because, uh, you know, uh, the, the warehouse t t is the same where they have your raw materials and your end product. So they are stuck. So because of uh, 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 over overflow of inventory, you know, uh, some uh, supply chains get stuck. Exactly. And that's also a very interesting topic that clients reach out to me is to improve their efficiency on their sites due to the fact that they are full of inventory. Yeah? And how yeah. can how can they just handle this increased inventory on their sites and making yeah, site efficiency and improve site efficiency? That's that's another part to the whole story. Yeah? That's a totally unexpected uh, disruption, I would say. That's another time of a disruption. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so now we get into the, the, the area of a digital twin, how to handle all this. Yes. Yeah, so as I said, yeah, that's that's a concept, a new concept mm -hmm. and a new approach. And as I said, it only makes sense if we also uh, yeah, can make that available. And we implemented the aforementioned core pillars into a digital twin, mm -hmm. not only reflecting the underlying uh, supply chain data, but also reflecting the, the different planning paradigms and being capable of doing stress testing and applying for different mitigation options. And, and if we use that, and that's something that we have seen in the past, then we can actually yeah, come to a point of, of having a de-risk supply chain, bringing strategy thoughts into execution. Yeah, so, and that's what, what I like the most about risk assessment. It's not only I would like to stop at a certain point. I would like to make my supply chain really more resilient. Yeah? And we can quantify what to do and where to do it. And that's what I like about that approach. And what do we see here? We see some uh, some views of a uh, digital twin, I presume. Exactly. Here we can see some some uh, screenshots of our solution um, and the different yeah, process steps that we follow. Yeah. So from a stress testing perspective, we have a scenario comparison that we offer. Yeah. So we can see how is the impact on downstream or upstream uh, production resources or other resources. We can compare different setups um, of the supply chain and different stress testing, and we can also see what is the impact on our uh, or the proposal of mitigation allocation. And if we agree then we can also release it back to our uh, tactical planning instance. And, and, and to, to, to be sure, you know, um, a digital twin is a kind of a simulation model, but based on actual data of orders in your warehouse management system or your ERP or transport management system. So it's not just a linear program or heuristic model. It's with real order data yeah. as an input. Yeah. So, I mean... Defining what is meant behind a digital twin yeah, is its own uh, webinar for itself, I would say. But mm -hmm. our digital twin surely connects the underlying data and we connect mm -hmm. to ERP systems, for instance, mm -hmm. use the data that is also used for supply, for tactical supply chain planning, then yeah. setting up the whole decision making and the whole planning paradigm. So we mirror what is being, what are the mirroring the planning paradigms as they exist for uh, tactical planning instances. Because we want to, to mirror uh, a supply chain in our stress testing and mitigation as it exists also for supply for tactical supply chain planning. Yeah? So to be very close to what yeah, exists today in, in the company. And so then enhancing... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. So enhancing the data also with the decision-making. Yeah? It's not only about making a mirror, a data mirror, but also making a decision mirror. That's a digital yeah. twin. So, so now we here see an um, uh, example of a stress test. Maybe you can explain it, uh, how you read this uh, chart. Yes, so that's yeah maybe the main result out of a, a stress test, because now we would like to know what is the criticality of our resources. If one specific resource in our network is being disrupted, what is the impact on supply chain performance, for instance, in terms of lost sales, which you can see on the on the on the y axis? Yep. I'm pretty much sure that um, each supply chain head and supply chain manager knows about maybe the three most critical resources or even five critical or ten critical resources. But what we do in our approach, we consider each and every resource in the network and consider what is the impact on lost sales 
if this resource is being disrupted. Mm. And then, of course, the remaining network has to compensate and can survive yeah, for a specific time. But then uh, we also encounter a huge lost, lost sales. Uh, what, what, what you can you, see here. Mm -hmm. What do you consider as a hidden risk? Yeah, what you see here as the, as the white points are the obvious risks. Yeah, So okay. where we know, where we are pretty much aware of um, what are critical resources among our different market regions. But sometimes we are really surprised. And that's also something that we saw with our customer that um, there are some hidden risk nobody was aware of. Oh, that's interesting. Why does this resource, if it is being disrupted, show up in this highly critical list? Yeah, and that's that's so something that nobody was aware of previously. But once doing this stress test, we then see there are resources that really have an impact on our supply chain performance, and it would be good to have uh, an eye on those resources. And if you look at, oh, sorry, and if you look at. Uh... The timeline, and uh, there's an interesting approach to that. Yes, so once is to know about the critical resources, but as you maybe agree, a disruption can have different uh, length of, um, yeah, one might uh, only endure like one week or two weeks, but we also might have a disruption duration of four weeks and six weeks, and that's what is depicted here. And it directly has an impact on supply chains in terms of the production volume, the overall production volume. And what you can see here is that for the green resource, the increase of disruption duration from one week to two weeks to four weeks into six weeks has an impact on the production volume in percentage. Compared to the uh, white resource, this impact is higher. Yeah? So just considering the supply chain impact a, dis a resource disruption has, we can see, okay, the green resource might be uh, more critical than the white one. Okay. But but what we need to do, and that's maybe exactly on that slide, is to see we need to compare that in terms of lost sales, because we are not only interested in supply chain impact, but we are also interested in the financial risk that is behind an impact on the resource. And now we can see that the white resource um, has much higher lost sales combined to the different durations of a disruption than the green one. So we need to take really track of the white resource instead of uh, the green one. Interesting. And, and, and you know, um, what kind of mitigation uh, strategy can you follow in this this case? Or yeah, that's general? yeah, that's that's maybe um, also interesting to see um, from a stress test and perspective. We identify critical and we identify how critical and what are the interdependencies. Yeah. Um, and here, what we can see, for instance, from a monitoring perspective, we see for the green resource, we, we do not need to take care for one to four weeks of disruption duration. Yeah. But if it increases to six weeks, then we need to do something. So also from a monitoring perspective, we see, okay, our green resource is being disrupted. What can we do? We should we should do something. And then immediately we have this war room situation, very reactive, because everybody's worried about this disrupted resource. Here, we clearly see at which point in time we need to, to care. Yeah? So one week, two weeks, four weeks, we have the same amount of lost sales, but only jumping to six weeks, it increased tremendously. So with regards to monitoring, that pretty much helps us. And now coming to mitigation, exactly, yeah. because <laughs> stress testing is one, knowing the criticality, but the second is what can we do against it. And as I said, there are so many different opportunities. And here we have a look on the decision-making in between dual sourcing, does it pay off? Yeah? Yeah. And um, we need to answer that question for which product, for which site, and in which quantity should we do, should we go for dual sourcing or not? And therefore, I've depicted here on the left-hand left -hand side, if dual sourcing is beneficial, and on the right-hand side, if single sourcing is more beneficial. We see different sites and key materials, like three different key materials. If we consider site A, um, on the left-hand side for dual sourcing being beneficial, we see that product, um, the second product and the third product are beneficial for dual sourcing, while yeah. the first product is not. Yeah? And we can do that for all the different sites within the overall network. And if you consider the, the number of materials that customers have and asking themselves, particularly in the pharmaceutical industry, should I consider a second supplier for this material? Phew, there are so many materials. Yeah. 
where, where to make a decision, where to make a cut. And we can propose which material would make sense in terms of um, yeah, stabilizing uh, supply chain performance. Yeah, so that's why you can see here the different risk optimal um, dual sourcing ratios. Cool. If you look at uh, well, uh, next to uh, dual sourcing and single sourcing, you can can also ex ex expand your your capacity. So how do you explain that uh, kind of decision? Exactly. Yeah. So um, we can have a capacity increase, and here we see um, on the x-axis the proposed capacity extension, and uh, on the y-axis we see different resources. And there might be now some resources where we do not need to include a major capacity. Uh, increase. Yeah, so it's not beneficial at all. So we do not need to consider those capacities. Yeah? Maybe mm -hmm. it's just below 10% something. But then there might be some capacities or some resources where we should focus on increasing the productivity of those resources because there are higher than 10% capacity increase as being suggested by the mitigation approach. And then there might be some resources um, that really have a larger increase, like more than 30% of their current capacity level. And that clearly indicates, okay, we, we might need to go here for an uh, expansion and consider CapEx if it's beneficial also from an investment point of view. And that's kind of a visibility giving to, to the customers to, to, have, you know, to which resource should I focus on. Okay. Well, in yeah, which, yeah. In which term, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting to have a more analytical approach of your whole portfolio and also your your, your capacity uh, points. I would say also your own on your and the, your outsource one. So, uh, you know, wrapping up, uh, we're getting to the end of uh, the webinar. So maybe you can say what what are the main approaches, and then we go. Yeah, then maybe know. wrapping it up. Yeah, what what does it all mean if we consider strategic? Um, uh, network planning as a base case situation, comparing it to different uh, disruptions through the stress testing and then the proposal that mitigation options give mm -hmm. and seeing, okay, it's particularly here for the capacity case, we see um, we can offer decision support with regards to where to redesign your capacities today for the uncertain future of tomorrow. You know? mm -hmm. First and second, maybe where to reconfigure your supply chain to achieve robust profit for years. If we do not have this large capacity increases or large inventory increases or large purchasing perspectives. And then third, but uh, third, increase your supply chain network resilience to a maximum level. Yeah, so that's kind of the approach uh, objectives that we can get out of it. So, uh, Thomas, so if you uh, would wrap it up, so what is... Uh... What are the, more, the most important point for, for the new approach of uh, supply chain risk management? Yeah, first of all, uh, I hope you enjoyed the webinar, but I also do hope that we could bring across a couple of points. Yeah? And for me, the most important points are we need to change our perspective on risk. So don't forget, stop chasing events, focusing less on probabilities, but more focusing on the vulnerability in your end-to-end -end network then really start quantifying the risk. And remember that is going via expected loss sales and profit. And for that, we use the digital network twin. And it's also about discovering the hidden risks as Iris just explained. And then use this intelligence to introduce what we call risk-aware decision-making in five key processes. These are the processes we show here. Mm -hmm. And in the end, there's the objective here and the need to focus more on structural preparedness, because in this turbulent environment, we cannot compensate the challenges with firefighting. We need to invest really in structural preparedness, but we don't have endless resources. We need to do it there where it matters. And in the end, all this is not futuristic. Yeah, it can be started tomorrow. Yeah, there are very tangible concepts, processes and solutions behind. Yeah, and uh, we think it's a it's a big untapped opportunity yeah, for many companies to invest in this new yeah, more modern risk-aware decision-making approach. Yeah, it's, it's quite cool, and there's a lot to do. I would say um, we, we have some time for for some Q and A, but it's quite short uh, in time-wise. So, but um, um, so my 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 question would be to Thomas. You know, there are risks, but I guess, uh, and I think that companies who are more prepared to all this. They also uh, can have a lot of profits and gain out of it if they are more prepared. So what is your assessment? So, you know, you can have your current service level, but in the end, 
if, you know, in these turbulent times, uh, some competitors are not able to deliver. So if you are better prepared, you can uh, have also an uptake on all this. Yeah, I mean, I think you see it, we see it in many industries, right? This more differentiated approach on risk management, it helps you avoid the downsides through putting the buffers where they matter most. And it helps you also capture yeah, weaknesses of others. And we think this will become more and more a license to operate for companies, right? To have this very precise way of doing it. We see it in many, in many uh, uh, industries, right? That the that the the swings, stockouts, inability to deliver, they are being leading to very dynamic market behavior, and you better be on the right side of benefiting from these uh, these uh, from the short materials and availability in the markets. All right. Um, I see some more questions, uh, but uh, it's already five o'clock, and uh, maybe people have to jump off to another uh, meeting or whatever. So, um, so we have some uh, next uh, thirty minutes uh, in the lounge, so you can talk to Thomas, uh, Iris, and myself in the lounge. We will be sitting at table one. So, if you have some questions and you ha would like to have a further conversation with the three of us, uh, please join us afterwards in the lounge. So, kind of Zoom meeting will open up. So. Uh, I'm happy to have this uh, uh, extended conversation with the three of us and uh, some people attending. So please join us. And um, there is some further information about what we have discussed earlier. So um, you know, on the left-hand side, you see our consulting supplement with all the consultants. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you see the contact details of uh, Iris and Thomas and also some direct links to uh, the avatar tool of supply chain risk management and also uh, an article about, uh, written by uh, Iris and uh, Thomas. So with this, uh, I would like uh, to wrap up and uh, thank the audience for watching. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Iris for uh, explaining all this. Iris, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you for having me here. You're welcome. Um, Thomas, also thank you for, uh, for explaining and to have an overview of uh, all the risk and uh, the new approaches for all this. Yeah, thanks a lot, Martin. It was a pleasure. Likewise. So uh, for now, I would like to thank you all. And uh, as I said, uh, you know, join us in the lounge um, and we'll uh, talk further. Uh, if not, maybe I will see you in another webinar. Uh, next Wednesday, there will be another one. And uh, thank you for now. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And maybe we we'll see you uh, in the lounge. <laughs>